So um, our next speaker is going to be Dima Olinichenko. And um, for clarity, use bulk Olinichenko instead of bulk Shen now, because um, we are now talking about hadronic transport. And again, please use the Slack and not the Zoom. Take it away, Dima. Uh, yeah, just one moment. Let me move my windows around. If I'm getting something covering my presentation. Okay, I think I'm ready. Okay, hi people, hi everybody. This is Smash Hadronic Transport Session. Uh, and I'm starting with a lecture and immediately I'm starting with a question. So people that are not here can come back and people who are here just show that they are here. Uh, I'm starting with, with the main physical idea in Jetscape probably is separation of hard and soft physics. And I just want to make sure that you know what hard and soft physics means. So press yes, no. Uh, and right now, starting from this moment, take 60 seconds uh, to think of it and type it and then post it in the chat after 60 seconds. So you don't interfere with each other. So now 60, 60 seconds countdown is going. We are seeing yeses and nos tick up and the the what we're seeing is that about two to one are saying yes to no. Which means it's a good question. Then it's a really good question. Because when I was a student and once I, I was just at the lecture and somebody was talking about hard and soft and I thought, is it like hardware and software? Uh, is it like theor theoretical physics and experimental physics, hard physics and soft physics? Uh, and then I realized it's completely different terms. So. Okay, we have another 20 seconds and in 20 seconds, we just post the answers. I think someone may have reset the poll because now we're seeing four to four. So I see fewer total responses. So just make sure that you have a, that you have, click yes or no again, if you already did it, please. Okay, so I don't see the chat. The chat is overviewed by the teaching assistants. So I don't know exactly what you are posting in the chat, but I hope but that it is. We haven't seen a lot of comments on either the Zoom or the, the slack so okay so right now you can actually post 60 seconds are, are gone now you don't interfere with each other now press your enter by far the winning answer is hasn't answered yes yeah hasn't an answered yet okay Well, Christine, let me know when I should continue because it seems to, to be taking longer than I expected. Yeah, so we're seeing a lot of, uh, well, I think the mo most people have not answered the poll, the yes or no question yet. Um, I'm, we're starting to see more um, responses in words on the Slack chat and a handful on Zoom. Um, but let me say, I think, Christine, I lost you. I lost you too. So to to summarize, there, there are some responses on on Zoom. Um, high PT, hard QCD, low PT, soft low PT particles emerging from hydrodynamics or other processes. Hard physics mostly from initial hard scattering. That's a decent answer. I think let's. Let's just go on with it. I think it's, it was just important for me to know that you understand what's going on. So yeah, that's, that's my next point. So high momentum pair particles and this momentum cut is, well, you said that it's not very clear where it is exactly, but let's say above 10 GV, it's definitely hard physics. Below 3 GV, it's definitely soft physics. Somewhere in between is a complicated region. So when we are talking about hard physics, it's high momentum or jets. And about soft physics, it's low momentum or bulk. That's 
what the next point is showing, hard physics is perturbative QCD and jets, and soft physics is statistical models and hydrodynamics and low PT physics. Uh, now, there, there is some nice picture how to think about this. You can either imagine a fountain of water, and that would be a jet, and this fountain of water is shooting through the dense fog, that will be bulk. Or if you are more into stronger interaction, then you can imagine jet in jacuzzi. Then a jet of water will be going through the jacuzzi and the water in jacuzzi will be the bulk. So this will be the picture for jets in the fog. And then jets of water will correspond to harder physics and fog will correspond to softer physics. Or you can think about water jets in jacuzzi. And in both cases, it makes sense to think about some scale separation. In Jetscape, scale separation is realized very explicitly. Now, this is the picture that James was showing on Monday. And you can see that the top row is corresponding to jets, so corresponding to hard physics. And the bottom row is corresponding to the soft physics. So jets are logically separated from the soft bulk part. And in the end, everything is supposed to fit to hadronic cascade, which is not exactly true. Now, here on the next slide, you can see that there is a little to-do thing. Now, James was actually assuming that particles from jet are feeding to the last stage. It is not true yet. Uh, the only thing that gets into the hadronic cascade is particles from the hydrodynamics. So let's go uh, and look at the codes first. Uh, this is also what James was showing. And there are different codes that work on the hard part. And there are different codes that work on the soft part. Mm. And you can see Smash is on the very right. It is doing the hadronic rescattering. And we are going to be talking about the Smash hadronic transport here. So, OK, now let's Let's go once again and review specifically the soft part. Uh, this is the typical picture for the uh, soft, soft part of heavy ion collision simulation. There is some initial state for the hydrodynamics, and the hydrodynamics, was, which Chun was really extensively discussing in his lecture. Uh, and then at some point, uh, hadronization happens. And there was also a good question, what's the difference between hadronization and particleization? at some point. So hadronization is when quarks turn uh, into, uh, into hadrons, and it can happen in the fluid phase. So, uh, and particleization is when you turn fluid into particles. It can happen in the hadronic phase. Uh, so here, maybe even better term would be particleization. So fluid is turned into particles, and then smash takes over. This is the hadronic transport approach, which corresponds to the dilute phase of the collision. Why does it make sense to use both hydrodynamics and transport? It is not so easy. It, may, it means that you have to combine codes. Um, but it also means that each code is applied in its region of applicability. Hydrodynamics needs local thermal equilibrium. And it needs that the mean free path is much smaller than system size. The fact that mean free path is much smaller than system size um, in a way, implies high density. Mm. And at high density, you solve hydrodynamic equations. On the contrast, transport doesn't like high density. Because for transport applicability, the mean free path has to be larger than Compton wavelength. Uh, so transport prefers low density region, which means that um, in this case of the hybrid approach where hydrodynamics is at high density and transport is at low density, everything as it is, it is at its region of applicability. This is good. Um, only the transformation is a bit complicated, but that's another issue. So, okay, once again, we are talking about the last stage of the collision, which is hadronic transport approach. I don't know if you see my uh, mouse pointer, but here it is on the right. Let's look in more detail into the transport approach. Transport is a rather, rather simple thing conceptually. You just have a set of particles with their coordinates and momenta. Particles can propagate, collide, and decay. And that's it in principle. But then the devil is in the details. Uh, because the question is, what particles, how exactly they propagate, how they collide, and how they decay. Uh, 
So let's go and look into it in slightly more details. Um, before that, I just want to mention in general where hadronic transport is useful. It is not only just component of Jetscape. It can be used, first of all, for some standalone simulations, and it really makes sense to simulate heavy ion collisions at relatively low energies with just pure transport approach. So at really low energies, you don't necessarily need hydrodynamics. I think this is important to point out, especially for people who are used to LHC and RIG, that at lower energies, you might not necessarily need hydrodynamics and you can model everything with the transport approach. Then um, some transport approaches actually come with the partonic part, and then you can do full simulations at any energies without hydrodynamics. On the other hand, at higher energies, um, let's say I'm approximately making this around 20 GeV, uh, then it, it makes sense to use hadronic afterburner with hydrodynamics. First hydrodynamics, then afterburner. Uh, and there are also fancier ways to apply hadronic transport. Sometimes people simulate electron ion or neutrino ion collisions with hadronic transport. And sometimes you need them for cosmic ray simulations. Then, um, now when you have a general idea of what transport is doing in the jetscape, it is the last hadronic stage. Mm, I would like to discuss some theoretical foundations behind the transport. Mm, conceptually, most of the transport codes um, rely on Vlasov and Boltzmann equations. Uh, sometimes, not, not all transport people will, will agree with me on this, because sometimes people say we, we are doing Cardano-Bame equations, for example, but if you simplify Cardano-Bame equations, after some approximations, they will still become Vlasov and Boltzmann equations. Uh, so the I, I want to stop here and ask you a question. Have you actually heard about Vlasov and Boltzmann equations before, maybe on your lectures or in conferences? Please press yes and no. And if you have heard about them, then write one or two random facts in the chat. And again, you have 60 seconds to think and only then press enter, just not to interfere between different people. All right, I cleared the poll and we're seeing the no's rack up faster than the yeses. That's probably because the people who know that they don't know can answer very quickly. That's good. That's good. So again, I'm happy that there are no's because then it means this lecture is not useless. It's there are some so, people that don't know about Lasson and Boltzmann equations. It's about 22 to 35. So I think there's more no's than yeses. It's about maybe 40 to six. Well, the no's are, are winning faster now. <laughs> what about the random facts? Okay, like- you No random facts appearing yet. Okay, you still have 20 seconds to, to think of random facts because I, I hear some people typing already. You are confusing yep. other people. Yeah, now we're getting random facts. Okay. Okay, now you are, you are free to type in random facts. Press your enters. Okay, I don't hear a lot of clicking right now. Uh, so I assume that there are some answers uh, about random facts and I will let TAs deal with them. And now I will actually go and tell something about Vlasov and Boltzmann equations. Uh, so <laughs> this is immediately the Vlasov equation. It looks like a big equation. If you look at it, it is an equation for the variable f, which is a distribution function. 
The distribution function is on the bottom of the slide. It is easy to think about it as the number of particles per unit of phase space volume. And the whole Vlasov equation, although it looks a little bit complicated and long, uh, it is just about conserving the number of particles and phase space volume. So essentially it is writing that d distribution function to d time equals zero. Uh, and it assumes that there are no collisions. You just have particles interacting via potentials. So for particles interacting via potential, you conserve the number of particles uh, and you conserve the phase space volume. This is little bit clever. So Vlasov equation is a clever way to write this down. And if you think of the analytical structure of this equation, this is um, this distribution function is depending on time, on coordinates, and on momentum. And well, it is an equation on seven-dimensional function. And it has a self-consistent potential in it. So uh, the potential is integral of pairwise potential and the distribution function itself. This is how you understand the Vlasov equation. And you can see that there is a zero on the right side of the equation. It means that there are no collisions. Then a harder modification of Vlasov equation is Boltzmann equation. The left-hand side is exactly the same. But the right-hand side is corresponding to the collisions. So I'm, what I'm doing here is all non-relativistic, just to keep it slightly simpler. Uh, so now, uh, on the left-hand side, you see the same thing that was in the Vlasov equation, df, the distribution function to d time. And in Vlasov equation, it was zero. And in Boltzmann equation, it is going to be equal to something called collision integral. And collision integral is number of particles in phase space that you gain minus number of particles in the phase space that you lose. You both gain and lose due to collisions. Uh, I like to think about Boltzmann equation as a pure bookkeeping. You know, think of volume in, in the phase space as some kind of cube or just illustrated in your mind as some kind of volume. And then by collisions, particles can escape from this volume to some other volumes and particles can enter to this volume from some other volumes. So d to dt of number of particles is number of collisions that bring particles to the volume minus number of collisions that bring particles out of the volume. Now the first equation is, is very clear. It is just a bookkeeping of number of particles in the phase space volume. But then when you really expand it, when you substitute that number of particles as distribution function times phase space volume, then you rewrite the left-hand side as the Vlasov equation. And then you rewrite the right-hand side as this big collision integral on the bottom. And then you get the actual Boltzmann equation for one particle species. And in its essence, Boltzmann equation is just bookkeeping particles in the phase space. But then if, if you look at its structure, it's a big integral differential equation on the distribution function. So the unknown is this distribution function f and how it changes with time. Uh, and it is seven dimensional. So it has time, three coordinates and three momentum in it. So it is already a complicated equation, integral differential seven dimensional equation. Uh, but what we know about it, it has some really nice properties. Um, okay, this, this equation, I forgot to mention a few assumptions that you assume that particles entering every collision are uncorrelated. And in this case of Boltzmann equation, you just have two to two collisions. And you are also assuming that there is a separation between potentials acting on, on some longer range and between short range interactions which go into the collisions. And after this assumptions, you have this Boltzmann equation. Why it is good? It has some nice properties. The first property is called H theorem. It means it is a theorem, you have to prove it. It means that entropy, if you calculate entropy within this equation, entropy is always growing or staying constant. Uh, and it's happening regardless of the cross sections of collisions that you put in. This is a beautiful property because it means that 
whatever gas with whatever cross sections you have, it's going to thermalize. And the corresponding equilibrium distribution function is going to be like this. This is also part of the derivation of the H theorem. Uh, now, the, my, my Boltzmann equation was non-relativistic on the previous slide, but here I'm already given the, the equilibrium distribution for the relativistic Boltzmann equation. And now, if you integrate this distribution function with momentum and with energy, uh, then what follows, follows from it is the ideal hydrodynamics. So if you take Boltzmann equation, assume local equilibrium, so assume that it reached maximum entropy locally everywhere, uh, and uh, integrate, then you will have hydrodynamic equations. Uh, what, what's important and what I wanted to show, on the top there are regions of applicability for hydro and Boltzmann equations. There are regions where Boltzmann is applicable and hydro is not applicable. There, are, there is a region where both Boltzmann and hydro are applicable. And there is a region where only hydro is applicable, but Boltzmann is not. And you can differentiate them by, by Knudsen number. Uh, so if the mean free path is comparable to the system size, uh, then hydro is not applicable. And for Boltzmann, uh, then, then you judge by microscopic scale, the mean free path has to be larger than, uh, than the Compton wavelength. So what, what's important here, you have to remember that you can derive hydrodynamic equations from Boltzmann equations. But the regions of applicability of hydro and Boltzmann are not exactly the same. Uh, in practice, we don't just have one particle species. Before, it was just one particle species. Uh, what we have is a lot of species of hadrons, like pions, ros, kaons, all these fancy a's and phi's, nucleons, deltas, and stars. Uh, and it's more than 100 species, even if you don't account for charges or for isospin. So you have a lot of coupled equations. The left-hand part is the Vlasov part, and d distribution function 2d time, and the right-hand part is a big collision integral. And now in collision integral, the reactions are not only uh, 2 to 2 elastic collisions, but there are also inelastic collisions. So these collision integrals become so big that it doesn't even make sense to write them. Uh, how to solve this connected system of equations? A seven-dimensional system, uh, uh, seven-dimensional functions, distribution functions, and its system of more than 100 equations. And probably the only way to solve it in a reasonable way is the Monte Carlo approach, which means that instead of solving equations like the differential equations on some grid, you don't solve them on the grid. Uh, you assume that you have, uh, that your distribution is a set of delta functions. So you, you essentially sample uh, some particles with their coordinates and momenta. This is what delta functions mean and with particular masses. But instead of one particle, you sample many of what is called test particles. This part, test particles don't necessarily represent physical particles. They represent distribution function. And then you substitute this distribution function in collision integrals. Uh, and in simulation, it means that you are actually simulating the collisions. So in a way, you are computing these collision integrals, but you are computing them in, the, in a Monte Carlo approach, which means that you are dealing with actual particles in your simulations that can collide. Uh, and decay. And when I'm saying actual particles, I mean test particles. So this is still a representation of the distribution function. Now, uh, okay, uh, there are different types of transport models. And two most prominent types are called QMD and BUU. Uh, I'm not asking for any random facts now. I just want you to, to press yes and no uh, for if you have heard the terms QMD and BUU before. Okay, how's it going? Is anybody pressing yes and no? Yeah, we have 15 yeses and 54 noes. So I think that you can assume no. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I'm happy that some people